And I think that's what space art, you can look at it and you could think, whoa. And so I think space art can invoke these deep, complex feelings about human nature and where we fit in. Welcome to Profoundly Pointless. My name is Nick. In this episode, we're going to look at space art. Our guest is Dr. Lacey Brock. She's a planetary astrophysicist and an artist. And what she does is create artwork that showcases what different objects in our universe really look like. Thank you for joining us. Like and subscribe if you get a chance. So what came first for you, the science or the art? I think they both came at the same time, honestly. I've been obsessed with science since I was little, maybe four years old. And I can't remember a time when I didn't have a paintbrush in my hand. They've always been next to each other. And I've done them simultaneously my whole life. When did this kind of become the goal for you? I, I have the cliche story. I loved looking outside at the sky and seeing the clouds and looking at the stars. And I grew up in Indiana on a farm. And I just decided that I wanted to study weather, space, and volcanoes. Just all of it. I didn't know that you had to pick a specific focus. I thought that you could just be a scientist and you did everything. And painting was always just sort of this fun hobby for me. Not, I never planned to sell my art to people. I, I didn't even show my art to people, really. I, no one really knew I could paint. It was just sort of my little secret. Then when did it transition into full time? Probably in 2017, I was a graduate student at uh, the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory here in Tucson at the University of Arizona. The department I was in actually had this annual space art show called the Art of Planetary Sciences. And I thought, what, a whole show with space art? And I had always loved painting landscapes and space and sometimes animals. So I painted something and I submitted it to the show. And I also helped volunteer and helped run it because it was run by grad students in our department. And I submitted one piece. It was something I did in spray paint. And um, when the night of the opening of the show, I was standing on the main floor and I could see my piece in the background. I was so nervous. Like nobody knew like I was lacy and that was my art, except, you know, my friends in the department. So strangers were walking around looking at the art and I saw somebody just stand at my piece for a long time. I mean, maybe it was only three minutes, but to me that somebody I didn't yeah. know was staring at my art for the first time. And I got really excited and anxious and I just kind of, I'm awkward. So I walked over there and I just was like, I painted that. <laughs> I was like, I'm, that's me. I was like, no, why did I do that? But I, I just thought I wanted, I wanted to know like, did they like it or was it yeah. weird? <laughs> like, tell me about it. Um, right. I, like, I think I blacked out after that. I don't know what he said. I think he was like, oh, the, the colors are nice. It's not, he liked it, but I don't remember exactly what he said. But yeah, right. I, def I did that. <laughs> I know what you mean, right? Like you want to say something like profound and cool and then it just comes out like, me did that. Like, <laughs> I'm Lacey. Thumbs up. <laughs> Goodbye. But it was a completely different feeling from, oh, I painted this for fun and, you know, gave it to a family member or gave it to a friend or just hung it up in my room. I would imagine that that would be inspiring in the sense that somebody that you didn't know liked the work that you were creating. Yeah, I think a lot of artists probably feel this way, but we are our own worst critics and we paint something and see it almost differently than somebody else may view the art. And so I thought my painting was cool, but I didn't think it deserved to be in this art show with other real artists. I had sort of trouble with my identity. I didn't really think I could call myself a real artist. Did that hold you back at all? I think maybe if I overcame that challenge earlier in my life, I would maybe have shared my art sooner. But it kind of goes back to when I was younger. I got all of this advice from my high school guidance counselor, especially. You can't be a scientist and an artist. People would actively give me that advice. And it made me think that scientists weren't artists. 
why would somebody give you that advice? Like, what was the kind of? I mean, not obviously, we're not like looking this guy up and going after him necessarily. Let's get up.、Right? But <laughs> let's we're getting this guy. All right, <laughs> unleash the mob. But like, why? Why would there be that kind of a feeling amongst people that you can't combine science and art? Is that? I don't know. It was. I remember sitting in the guidance counselor's office, and I, I mean, I. My, I was raised by a single dad, and no one in my family has a college degree. I was a first generation student, so I went in there saying, "I would like to be a scientist and an artist. I would like to do something with both." And he, I'm kind of old, so he took the newspaper and he tossed it at me, and he said, "Look in the classifieds. Do you see a wanted ad for an artist?" And、yeah. I think it was this old mentality: starving artists, art isn't a real career. And so I think when people, when I said these are the things that I really like, people were like, "Well, you can't survive being an artist. Why would you do that? Like, go for science." And no one ever, like these people. I, I, I remember when I tell the story, people are like, "Well, why would you listen to a high school guidance counselor? They don't know what they're talking about." Well, I'm raised by a single dad, and I live on a farm in rural Indiana. Who am I going to listen to? My dad doesn't know. My grandma doesn't know. Like, who helps me? How do I learn? And so I had this idea in my head for so long that I couldn't do both. So when we talk about like space art, right? Like, okay, it's art about space, right? But how would you kind of? Categorize it. What fits into the category of space art? When I think of space art, I think of nebulae, galaxies,、um, planets.、Um, I, I think that space art can be real or imagined. Me personally, I really like to paint objects, real objects that were taken by images that were taken by telescopes. But I think space art can also be. Your own nebula that you create because the universe is very large, and there's a lot that we still don't know and understand. And for many many things, we don't have pictures of them. We don't have, you know, pictures of exoplanets light years away as we do of Jupiter in our own solar system. And so I think that space art can fall in this category of objects, but that could be something that you create on your own. And I think space art is really important now, especially as we're discovering all these exoplanets. What might this exoplanet look like? How can we compare that to Earth? And I think art really can come in to make communicating science more relatable and easy to understand. So, when you paint something or when you create a piece of space art, is it based off of the science? Like, okay, this is what we think that this thing might actually look like. Or is it more up to your interpretation? I think you can do both.、Um, I've definitely the objects that I studied during my PhD, brown dwarfs. I've definitely painted those before, and what they might look like were based in science. But、uh, there was a little artistic, you know, creativity there as well because I really like painting with bright, bold colors. I think the biggest thing for me with space art is that I have struggled trying to come up with my own style, and I think it finally clicked last year, where I painted this big painting of Jupiter's great red spot from a Voyager image, and it, I ended up really connecting this piece with science because I I thought. I can't just paint Jupiter's great red spot. I paint Jupiter all the time. I should do something different. So I took real research and data from the Hubble and Gemini telescopes, and I painted two large rectangles on the piece. And one of the rectangles was what the great red spot would look like in ultraviolet wavelengths, and the other was what it would look like in infrared wavelengths. And and this piece took me seven months. It was like the it was right like when my postdoc was finishing, and I was. Thinking, what am I? You know, what am I going to do? I really need a break. Maybe I'll just do art. And I looked at it and it clicked. And I, and I was like, this is my style: multi-spectral art, where I can take. And there's one piece behind me. And I I was like, I can take data and images from telescopes in different wavelengths and weave them together. And it tells you a story about the science just if you look at it. Why are there so many stars in that one part, but not over? Not over here, and so that's when I really thought, like, okay, this is my style, and this is how I can connect science and art, and, and this is who I am. 
does space art, in your opinion, does it seem to have the same kind of effect on people that other art does? Or is it something that like, oh, that's cool to look at? Okay, I'm probably biased, but I think that space art, it's hard for me to compare to other, you know, how people feel when they look at other art. But I think the sense that you get when you look up at the night sky and you realize that we live on a rock floating (laughs) in space that these feelings are deeply um i can't even just they're indescribable i think i even tweeted this a few days ago I, i just went outside to let my dog out and just looked up and was like whoa and i think that's what space art you can look at it and you could think whoa those are all galaxies you know and you kind of come to terms with wow i'm just a tiny human And so I think space art can invoke these deep, complex feelings about human nature and where we fit in. Is there life out there? And I think those feelings are maybe different than somebody might get looking at an abstract piece or a portrait. But for me, definitely, I think space art is just so profound. But again, I think I'm biased. And also, when I look at abstract art, I don't know. I don't know what to think. I don't know what I'm looking at, I get confused. So maybe, I don't know, maybe it's just me. I think the thing that would hold me personally back is like, that can't be real. Like, that's not real. Is that a challenge? Or I guess, what do you kind of think about? Like, in my mind, like, all right, there's this nebula, but it's not like real to me in the way that the tree outside is real to me. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, I'll tell you a story because I just talked about how space art, you know, can invoke these deep feelings of, you know, who we are, what's out there, is there other life? And I, I that's what I think. And so I was taking, uh, I took an art class for fun during my PhD. I was in the art department and for one of my first paintings, I did the Milky Way, like this night skyscape. And we were in critique in the class and another student said that my art was trite and it hurt. And I thought, how could you look at the Milky Way and think that it was trite? Because I'm also a scientist and I think, look at all, you know, how many exoplanets are out there? And I have all these thoughts about it. But this student was telling me that it was trite because it was I guess kind of popular on social media. A lot of people like painting galaxies or night skyscapes because it was popular. So she had a completely different perspective of a Milky Way painting than I did. And so I think that goes back to what you mentioned that maybe it's so hard to grasp and unrelatable that it's just not important to some people and it's overdone. I don't know that really, that was a weird day. I thought, How could you think that looking at the Milky Way? I guess I could see that both ways, too, in the same sense, right? Like, there's a famous painting of the soup can. Like, in one level, it could speak to this profound nature of our existence, or it's a fucking soup can. Yeah. (laughs) Right? It's kind of like... It's just an all-white painting for a lot of money. Stuff like... Yeah. And I don't think that is any less art. I just... In the same way that maybe somebody doesn't care about the Milky Way or they can't relate to that. I don't relate to a painting that's just all white because I really like color. So I don't understand. But I think that's part of the fun of art is that it is subjective and people can get different things out of different types of paintings. But do you like, do you feel an obligation that with your science background, that even though this can be up to interpretation that like, no, I kind of got to make this like what it really would be like or what I really think it would be to have a factual, so to speak, basis to it. I try to paint things accurately, but I'm not a stickler for it. And so I think it depends on the audience and the purpose for the art. If the graphic is specifically being designed to be the cover of a research journal or in an article, I think trying to make it look as realistic or portrayed as accurately as as you can is important because you may give somebody misconceptions. Uh, this this piece behind me, the reference images are from the James Webb Space Telescope, and I have tried to place all the stars as accurately as possible, and I've been counting them. 
guess how many stars I'm at so far. Like I would quit uh, at thirteen to be honest I have with you. Painted seven thousand five hundred and twenty one so far. I'm literally counting them like I'm a crazy person. <laughs> I because oh I thought, God. well, this will be fun <laughs> because I want to know like how many how many stars are just in this you know square painting. I, I wonder. So I guess when you go and you're gonna start a new painting, right? So what is generally speaking your process like what inspires you how do you decide what you want to do i think the most important important part of my process is creating the reference and lately i've been really inspired by the images from jwst and um, this piece combines two images from jwst one of them is a composite and it has near infrared and mid infrared wavelengths and the other one is just mid-infrared wavelengths. And I weaved those together in this checkerboard pattern to kind of show what the Pillars of Creation looks like in different wavelengths. And the JWST images, they keep coming out and I can't paint fast enough. <laughs> so I keep planning my next paintings. But um, with this multispectral art that I've created, I'm you know taking images from Hubble and from JWST and or other telescopes, and I'm trying to weave them together in interesting ways. And so what I'll do is I'll create a reference. And then after I've created that, I sort of deconstruct it in my mind, and I know exactly how to paint it. As soon as I have the reference, I know what I'm going to do. Uh, and I just sort of break it down in my mind into different layers, like slices. And I usually draw the image on the canvas and, you know, do a sort of underpainting to give the canvas some color. And then I start with a bunch of layers and I build up layers and details. And I love using lots of colors, bold colors, and a lot of details is sort of my favorite thing to do. Um, I can paint in six different mediums, I think, but oils is my favorite. Oils is, uh, these pieces behind me are in oils and those take a long time probably because I like adding little tiny details. I you, you probably can't even see them from far away, but I think if somebody would walk up to them, they could see all the subtle color changes and details in my pieces. And that's what makes me the happiest, just fun colors and details. How long will it usually take you? Like if you went from very start to finish? Depends on the size. And I've, I've never really painted full time. Um, Last July was when my postdoc ended, and I, I try to keep track of how many, you know, how long a piece takes, but but not rigidly because that gets that stresses me out, and I don't want to think about it. My large Jupiter painting, it's in the other room. That took me seven months. How popular would you say that it is compared to other forms it's of art? It's much more popular than I realized. I th I think when. We had the art shows in our departments. We had three or four hundred pieces sent from all over the world to a space art show. And that that's been going on for maybe ten years. It's probably hard for me to place it among other art. One, because I don't really like is this contemporary or modern? I don't really know. I don't really know the art lingo either. Um, but I was surprised that space art was more popular than I realized. I thought it was just gonna be me. <laughs> I thought I was like, I'm the one who's paints space. And I was like, wait a second. There's so many other people paint space as well. But there's, well, then how many of them also have PhDs though? You might be the only PhD space artist. I thought I was, artist. but I have some friends that I've met through social media that some people have their PhDs in art businesses. Are you ready for some harder slash listeners oh, no, submitted I'll questions? Try. I'm so bad at questions. What would you consider to be the best well, Jupiter, looking planet? Easy. I'm very passionate about Jupiter. It's Jupiter is my favorite planet. All of my followers on Twitter know that I'm obsessed with Jupiter. I I have a tattoo of Jupiter. But is it just because it has different colors? No, I think it's... I studied brown dwarfs, and those are sort of the in-between giant gaseous planets and low-mass stars. They have properties of both. And they have clouds, but early in their lifetimes, they confuse deuterium. They're these weird hybrid objects. And Jupiter is sort of the closest thing we have in our solar system to a brown dwarf. Um, 
But also, I've been obsessed with Jupiter since I was really, really young. It was my favorite planet. I, I just think, yes, it does look cool, but it's just I was obsessed with weather and storms. I, I actually started uh, as an atmospheric science major, but I switched to physics because I wanted to study clouds or storms on other worlds, which is what I ended up doing. And Jupiter just has the great red spot, a giant storm and other storms. And so it's like, you know, the combination of weather and storms and space. That's Jupiter just takes the cake. The other one is kind of, I guess, because you studied exoplanets. What's the best looking exoplanet? I don't, I have no idea. Well, do we know what they look like? We don't really know what they look like. That's something that JWST will help us study because we may find a planet that, you know, oh, it's in the habitable zone, but it could be, maybe it's orbiting a red dwarf. So, I don't know, its atmosphere has probably been vaporized long ago and, they're, you know, and it's tidally locked. So, we don't really know what they look like. That's where the artist renditions come in and help because we can take the data that we have like, oh, it looks like it has lots of hydrogen in its atmosphere. Or, so, you know, maybe it's a very primitive atmosphere. And then we could kind of, you know, paint something to represent what it might look like. I I can't I can't think of my favorite exoplanet. I know that the TRAPPIST-1 planets are really interesting simply because there are so many of them orbiting such a small star. So maybe those are, I pick those. Those are the best exoplanets. <laughs> Is there anything that you would consider to be like, oh, that's, I would like to do this, I'll use the word celestial body. I don't know if that's the right word or not. But like a thing in space that would like, I'd do that, but that's too hard. I thought painting a nebula would be really difficult because it's gas and dust and it's translucent in places. And when I started this piece, I thought it looked like shit. <laughs> like my, my squares, the checkerboard, it was just like really blue and really orange. And it, it did not look good when I started it. And I thought, uh Oh, I'm not going to be able to paint a nebula this way. I should have started the piece in a different way, but I think it's turning out. Okay. And I realized my method and approach worked. Oh, wait a second. I remembered. I have a painting. Saturn's rings. That's hard. That's why I haven't painted Saturn because I don't like painting, measuring and making things symmetrical. It's, it's really hard. I want the, I want the rings. I want the lines to look crisp and nice ellipse, but it's a pain. <laughs> I gave up on it. I'll, it's too I'll figure it out someday. Is there like one piece of, what would you say is probably the most popular spe piece of space art? I think people really like to imagine their own little, uh, like, I think, I think back to that girl who called my Milky Way tripe. I think what got really popular on social media a long time ago, maybe like way before I was like sharing art, people like to paint watercolor, just blues and purples and flick white stars on it, like, and say, oh, a galaxy. I think I think that's really popular, or it used to be, which is sort of why that uh, I keep calling her a girl, <laughs> a woman, <laughs> said, "Oh, that's trite." I think that's what got really popular, just sort of watercolor galaxies. Does the Earth count as space art? I think so, and also I'm not really big on this is space art. This is not space art because I I don't even know what other, I don't even know what contemporary art is. I couldn't look at a piece and tell you what kind of art it is. I, I think if you painted like a picture of a pineapple, it's not space art because it's a pineapple, but earth counts for sure. Best sci-fi art depiction. Interstellar, the black hole. That was really good. I'd say probably to answer oh, that, yeah. probably interstellar with the black hole. Kip Thorne is an actual astrophysicist and you know, worked with them with that film and so i think even a paper came out of depicting the black hole for the movie don't quote me on that but there yeah that there was a lot of work involved in trying to make the black hole look accurate um all right so this is one of the pictures of yours that jumped out at me because we talked about brown dwarfs so looking at this oh, how yeah. did you paint this why did you choose those colors kind of walk me through it so we 
we don't know exactly if a brown dwarf has banding on it. Jupiter has bands of color, different colors. It's rotating fast. Um, we don't really know exactly what a brown dwarf looks like, but we know that they have clouds and we know that they have different layers of clouds. And we've learned that through spectra of these objects, part of what I did during my PhD. So to paint this, I took the, I sort of took an image of Jupiter in my mind and some research suggested maybe brown dwarfs have banding. So I sort of did banding and, um, you know, sort of made little storms and eddies and brown dwarfs are bright in the infrared so we think that they may look like reddish brownish they're, they're not brown but like a red orange or a, like a magenta depending on the temperature and then maybe the coolest brown dwarfs are maybe like a like a dull purple um so i sort of took the possibility that they had banding because they do have in their atmosphere is clouds that, that idea from Jupiter and then you know the thought about what colors they may look like in the infrared how about this one now this is a Hubble's cosmic reef oh yeah that for what kind of looks like to me like the gassy stuff I don't know what word like what would that represent like what am I I guess what am I looking at star forming regions so star is being formed oh i have a description can... star forming regions of the large magellanic cloud oh okay so yeah there's a satellite like a small satellite galaxy of the milky way the large magellanic clouds and stars are forming in these regions usually when you see a, a nebula image like there are stars forming somewhere in there like the pillars behind me um, but the scale on this is like this is really this is really large, like light years across. I don't remember how many. How about this one? This looks more like an artist kind of interpretation, right? Oh yeah. So that's the moon Europa, and there was some interesting work uh, that came out that it might glow in the dark. So I I tried to. I tried to paint that there was a, a reference image that it was an artist conception, like, you know, maybe what the glow might look like. So I tried to combine um, Europa with the glow using actual images of Europa, actual images of Europa plus the artist conception. I try to just blend that together. So the bluish green part, it would be what the kind of brownish clearish part would be what? Um, the bluish part, I, I'm trying to remember the study. I think it was on the night side of Europa because um, Jupiter's magnetic field is just really, really immense. It's immense, very large, and um, the interaction with the surface of Europa is sort of where the glow might come from. And then uh, the, the non-blue part, like the browns and reds, those are... Um, like the cracks in the surface of Europa because there's a large subsurface ocean. And what we actually, a mission recently launched the JUICE mission to study the icy moons of the Jupiter system. And we don't really know how thick the ice shell is on Europa, but we know there's this global subsurface ocean and the, the cracks you get in the surface um, are sort of from the crust moving on that ice shell and the colors are from some type of hydrated salts. Europa is a really interesting moon, especially just because of the ocean underneath. There's a lot of interest in astrobiology for this moon. And the glow is just this really cool interaction with Jupiter's um, magnetosphere, I think. <laughs> How about one more? And this will be a big one. Oops. All right, this one. This is Jupiter's red spot, right? So kind of... That's the piece I was talking about earlier. Yeah, it's Jupiter's great red spot. The big storm that's larger than our planet that's been churning for hundreds of years. And the original image was taken in visible light from the Voyager spacecraft. Voyager 2, I think. Um, now, the rectangles are what Jupiter's great red spot would look like 
in different wavelengths of light. So the purple is ultraviolet and the red is infrared. And I, to, to simulate that, I used um, images and data from the Hubble and Gemini telescopes. And then I sort of superimposed and created those in this Voyager image. And the wavy stuff kind of round it, that would be what? So it's all the clouds moving around the spot. The spot, you can think of it like a, like a big hurricane, like a giant storm, larger than Earth. And so it's just the atmosphere is just churning the this, this storm. And then around it is just, you know, the other like little white circle below it is just another little storm. And it's sort of the clouds are spinning around and, you know, feeding the storm. And so in the different wavelengths, you could see that the um, in infrared, it kind of the brighter areas are the hotter areas. And then oh. in the ul- ultraviolet, you can see that um, the there there isn't any uh, blue or red. There isn't any red. It's all purple because different wavelengths of light are being absorbed. Um, so what you're seeing is this complex storm, and there's interesting chemistry that happens. There's an interesting chemistry with the sun's light that's hitting it. There's interesting reactions that cause haze and kind of make this red orange color around the spot and then the infrared areas just show you you know where the heat is being generated where there's more heat it looks cool yeah thank you it's my favorite one um so that's pretty much all the questions that we got what's kind of coming up next for you where can people find you where can people find the art that kind of stuff i'm on all the social medias all the places and it's at Stellar Arts, but it's spelled with an E, S-T-E-L-L-E-R, Arts. And it's not because I can't spell. It's because, like I said earlier, I like birds. And so the Stellar's J is one of my favorite birds. So it was like a way. Space, art, and birds, all in one. <laughs> Everything yeah, combined. Stellar Arts, uh, whatever, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube, Instagram. How far into space would you go? Leave the planet solar system galaxy like if you could how far out into space would you really go uh if so if i didn't have a family i i would go and never have to come back i mean i would go until uh, you know on a mission to where i knew i I was gonna die with a family obviously that changes unless i can take them uh but say i can't then uh i would just go i i would like to go to the moon then because what does that take two or three weeks to get to or two weeks or something I think it's three days to the moon and back, (laughs) but right. I think you can get to like Mars in a month. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even go to the moon. I think I would get just enough above where I could see like the whole earth. And then that's as, that's as far out into space as I'm really willing to go. For some reason, I've always had a fascination with the sun and I know it's not possible, but, uh, can you imagine getting, getting close to that? I mean, not, not obviously where it's going to, burn you alive but but close enough to where it's like fuck this is hot yeah dude i mean we can do that on earth just go to arizona (laughs) (laughs) you can go you can go to arizona and it can feel like that that thing's 93 million miles away and it's hot it's too hot in arizona and as a former arizona resident i can say that like that's close arizona is close enough to the sun for me that's as close as I need to get. So there's two things that you just that you just said that I'm interested. One, how did you know how many million miles it was just off the top of your head? I don't really know how you don't. I, I don't. Everybody know. knows the sun is 93 million miles away. Did you Mm-mm. did you not know that? I I, I mean I, I knew it was millions of miles. I I couldn't. I I probably couldn't. I would not have come within 50 miles of being correct. I'm sure. Well, I mean. When you're talking about millions of miles, 50 miles, you know that's, I mean? that's like, really nailing it down pretty close. Like if, if if you were to say, hey, John, you know, give me a guess of how many million miles away the sun is. I probably wouldn't have come within 25, you know, million miles or whatever of it of being correct. What would your guess have been before I said 93? I mean, I probably would have said, tw- I mean, 25. Yeah, but in my mind, there's also no difference between 25 million and 93 million miles. That's still... Like each one of those is like that's pretty far. 
I've always wondered how how you know how have they actually like measured accurately? Math, <laughs> yeah, okay, is the best answer for that. I mean, I think the actual answer is they can like look at gravity and things like that. I don't really know. I just know that smarter people like, but I don't. That, but people who are like, well, I don't understand how that works. Well, I don't understand how TV works either. It doesn't mean it doesn't work. I mean, I think understanding TV is a lot easier to understand than to say, hey, you know, the Milky Way galaxy is 655 million miles away when we've never explored it before. Well, it's not away. We're in it. Yeah, I know. I was I was using that as an example. You know, I don't think you really know too much about space (laughs) Or, or dinosaurs or dinosaurs. You know what? How far? How many miles away is the moon? Because I think I actually know. Let's let's both of us take a guess on how far away the moon is. I think I might know. Um, What's your guess? I feel how many gonna, miles? Uh, how many miles? Uh, oh boy, I don't know if it's a if it's millions of miles. I'll say it's uh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> let's see if it takes two days to get there. You said. Uh, you know what? I'm gonna right. say it's, I'm gonna say three hundred no five hundred thousand miles away. My guess was 186,000 miles. It's 239,000 miles away. Well, you win the price is right. Just that's crazy to me, right? Like that thing is, it's like right there. But it also doesn't exist in in reality to me. Like that's not, if that was just a painting up there, I would feel the exact same way about it. Like that's not real. Speaking of some days, I feel like I'm in the Truman Show where things happen on cue because I'm just in a gigantic you know, acting scene, and I'm the main actor. Some days I feel like that. Yeah, you are the star of your own universe, man. Oh, that's very nice. I'm a, I'm a bright star in a bright universe. Thank you very much. Very, very good. Okay, let's move on. You got a haircut, by the way? No. No. All right, fair enough. Uh, is, that, is that offensive to say that to somebody? Because I say that to people all the time, and some people respond well, and others I can tell like it kind of bothers them. If I'm, you know, wrong. If you ask if they got a haircut? Yeah. I don't know. I don't think asking if somebody got a haircut, like if that is becoming offensive to people, like if that's one of the things that we now can't ask people about, we've gone too far. If you get a haircut or do something new, do you kind of try to fight for acknowledgement? Right? Like, let's say you get a new shirt. (laughs) Will you walk in and be like, Arms out, showing it off a little bit. No, but I I will say this about my wardrobe is that when I do wear something new, people are like, oh, that's a nice shirt. I haven't seen that before because I have the same clothes on rotation. You know, once a yeah. week, you can. I'm pretty much down to a science. I don't quite have a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday schedule, but I'm definitely wearing the same five outfits throughout the week you know i'm still old school i still wear you know blue jeans and uh you know polo shirts and everything else into the workplace do you and your wife dress alike have you started have you been together long enough that you're starting to dress alike Nah, not really not really i mean she'll wear uh you know she'll wear like at night some of my shirts but you know they're big on her obviously that's what happens when you're 5x all right shout outs here let's start off here with a uh, Michaela Lindstrom, Aiden Henning, Adrian Garcia, Georgie Rivera, Jonas Webb. I don't know why, but I'm coming around on Jonas's lately. I'm not sure why, but I was kind of against that name, you know, five or six years ago. But uh, th- I'm kind of coming around. Jonas is, is, is an all right name now by me. Okay. Was it the Jonas Brothers that did that for you? Maybe, you know, and then I, I think I knew knew of a couple of Jonas's and I, you know, and they, they kind of rubbed me the wrong way. And uh, but, you know, listen, four or five years go by. Here we are. I'm, I'm all right. I'm getting all right with Jonas's. OK, sometimes it takes a little bit of time. A little bit, a little bit. It takes a little bit of difference. Another good Distance. name here. Uh, Bo Morgan. Bo is a good name, right? Is that now? Wait a minute. Is that a man or a woman? Uh, I, be- uh, I believe it's a man. It's spelled... B E A U, which to me is the acceptable uh, uh, way of of being a bow. I do not like B O S, but B E A U, I'm okay with. 
first of all, don't ma- badmouth Bo Jackson, probably the greatest athlete who ever lived. Probably the greatest athlete mm-hmm. of all time. Yeah, I mean that that's that's tough. I mean he he's definitely who, he's definitely up there, but I don't know if I would I would never I would not go on record saying he's the greatest possibly ever. I would say that maybe not in terms of athletic, but his okay. I mean in the sense of like athletic performance. Like if we tested all of the athletes ever, I think Bo Jackson and LeBron James would probably be at the top of that, where they're just a good at every single athletic measurable. LeBron's definitely up there. Bo is definitely. I mean, d- don't forget Deion Sanders. Not strong though. I mean, he was strong enough. He was a cornerback in the NFL for a decade. Wasn't a great tackler, if I remember correctly. But he doesn't have the strength. He had the speed. He had the quickness. He had the agility. Didn't have the strength like Bo Jackson or LeBron James does. We could talk about this forever. Yeah. I mean, anyway, Michael I'm okay. Jordan. We forgot Michael Jordan. No, not LeBron James caliber. All right. Uh, you're only going because LeBron James is, is considerably bigger body size, I would assume, than Michael Jordan yeah. was. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Sean Rennie. Luka Vukovic. Emmanuel Connie, and we're going to end with an easy one here with uh, here <laughs> with uh, Bill Ward. Just Bill nice, Ward, nice and simple. Just get it out of the Bill way. Bill Ward, I a hundred percent chance Bill Ward is from the southern part of the United States. <laughs> That's Bill Ward right there. If Bill, if you are, send us an email. We'll uh, we'll send you a complimentary eraser. I'm okay with the name Bo, but only if you live in Louisiana. I'm just not a big. I only fan. accept Bo's in Louisiana. I'm not a big fan of two letter names: Bo, Joe, uh, Mo, Mo, Mo. <laughs> I actually know a guy named Poe. You know, I mean, it's just you know, it's I, I don't know I don't why. F- just not a fan. It's not his real. I don't think that Bo Jackson's real name is Bo. Let's see what the Google says. Okay, well, I'll look it up. You do your thing. Uh, well, it's yeah. question time for you. His real name is Vincent Edward Jackson. Bo oh. is a nickname. I think that it, like uh, some women that I've known that have been nicknamed Bo, I think that they're usually pretty cool. But B-E-A-U is only Louisiana specific. Maybe, maybe some parts of Alabama. Maybe. So I've known one Bo uh, in my life as a, as a woman or as a – and her nickname was or her name was Beatrice. She went by Bo, and she's the only woman I've ever known to smoke, drink, and chew all within the same night. Bo is definitely <laughs> going to be a tomboy, and she's probably benching at least one thirty-five. Yeah, and that is no joke. She she hung with the fellas that night and uh, became <laughs> she became a legend. That's for sure. There are not many women who dip. I've known a few women who dip, and I was that was all women that I was like, I'm not messing <laughs> with that. I'm not. You just like look, you just yeah. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen. More power to you if you do it. Just know, uh, any of you listeners out there that are female, if you do all three of those things, you have a special place in in our hearts. Uh, all right. You do. Um, let's see. Were you a uh, front class sitter? Or were you a back class sitter? Always the back of the class. Always the back of the class and then slowly got moved to the front of the class before move, being moved back to the back of the class. But I was also, my last name is Vinzant, so I was also al- alphabetically always at the end. I was definitely a back of the class. Did you Specifically know, back right. Back right. According to a study recently re- uh, released that people that sit at the front of the class are 93% more uh, times often to be successful and have higher grades than those students who sit in the back rows of the class. Because they're paying attention. I mean, that's one of those things that's not really hard to figure out. I understand why we would have a study for that, but pretty much anybody could have told you that right from the very beginning. Generally, the people not paying attention to something are not the ones who do well on it. But every time I've gone into a classroom, that front row is always empty. So I don't. I didn't. You know, no one in my grade sat in the front. It was always a second row and beyond. No one wanted to be in the. My wife loves sitting in the front row, and it, it infuriates me. Does she make you sit next to you? Have you ever sat someplace else? Bes- like of, I'm not sitting. there. Of course, you know, uh, pre-K uh, orientation. We show up ten minutes late, and we have to go. You know, we have to take the two seats that are in the front. 
walk by everyone as we're 10 minutes late and then sit in the front of the class. It's like, come on. Oh, man. Everybody was staring you down like, well, that kid's not going to get in. Oh, yeah, for sure. Well, she didn't. So thank you very much. Well, even if you're not, you're still, the front row is relative. Like, even if nobody sits in the exact front row and you move towards the back, there's always a front row no matter how far back it starts. Yeah, sure. But there's still there's still a front row, right? There's still a designated front row. I would never certainly, even if I didn't, even if I was interested in the class or the thing that was going on and didn't know anybody else in there, I'd, I'd be hard. I might go, the closest I would go was high middle. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> like second to fourth row. That's it. As far as I'm going though. During, I remember during driver's training in high school, I sat in the front row because if I didn't, I would have fallen asleep. And that is the only time I've ever sat in the front row. Good. That explains a lot. I'm a good driver, except no, I have parking not, lot anxiety. John, you're terrible. I'm not, not a not terrible getting, driver. We're not getting into this. You're a terrible driver. Listen, I want to. I, I want to know something about Seattle because somebody that I, I know recently visited there, and okay. they posted a picture of themselves, and and this was their caption, and they said, "I'm next to the infamous gum wall." Is there a gum wall that's famous in Seattle? Yeah. It's a wall full of gum. It's disgusting. And I don't, it's one of those things that I can see the appeal. Like it is kind of a landmark. It is something that's popped up and is definitely unique. But to me, it's gross. And the few times that I've accidentally found myself in there, I had to like, I got to get out of here as fast as possible before I throw up. Like, I, it's disgusting. I know this is disgusting. hyper local, but I'm curious. Like, is it, is it like in a market? Is it in a restaurant? Like, like what's the like? How did it come to be a popular like tourist destination? I don't know. I didn't stop and read the plaques when I was there, <laughs> but it's next to Pike Place Market, which is this famous market in Seattle that is next to the basically the waterfront area. Okay. So it's Seattle used to be largely kind of a, it's a city that's kind of built on top of a city in certain places. So there's kind of an underground Seattle and the gum wall goes from like the underground ish Seattle up to the main levels of Seattle. People who are in Seattle are like, that's completely wrong explanation, but that's the best way that I could describe it. It's a unique place. Disgusting to me, but unique place. Interesting. Uh, all right. Second question. Would you rather be a uh, a Disney character? What was the first question? Um, about uh, um, the gum wall? No. What was the first question? I don't think you actually asked it. <laughs> um, God dang. I don't remember. I didn't write it down. I, I didn't. I only wrote one question down today, and it's this one. OK, <laughs> good work. Um, good work. Yeah, no, I don't know why. I don't know why it's escaping one job for this whole thing. Why is it escaping us? I don't understand. I don't remember why it's escaping. It's not escaping us. It's escaping. Oh, you. it was the uh, front class sitter or back class sitter question. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Okay. All yeah. Right. And then right. the, my job, my question job. is, um, or my second question uh, rather, which I'm forgetting as we we go on and on about this. Good thing I wrote this one down. Uh, would you rather be a Disney character? Or be casted in like a uh, like a, a superhero movie and be known forever as one of those type of uh, of characters. Superhero one that seems to me like yeah, because you don't necessarily know exactly what Disney character you're gonna get, mm -hmm. right? Even though I can't really think of any Disney characters I wouldn't necessarily want to be, except for maybe like Quasimodo, I wouldn't want to be cast as the hunchback of Notre Dame, <laughs> right. but I'm pretty much okay with just about any superhero because even if it's kind of ironic, like I can think some of the Deadpool characters that were in there, mm -hmm. like you're still a superhero and you're always going to be a superhero and you probably make lots of money off that because they use your likeness. I mean, you're, you're famous. I well, first off, I think you're famous forever, no matter what you do, uh, either or, but definitely superheroes. You probably get a little more fame than you do. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I don't think there's a lot of like conventions. If you get cast as a superhero, you can probably make a living off of the convention circuit, autograph circuit for the rest of your life. But I mean, how, how many how many uh, times do you go to Comic Con and there's John Scholl, writer of the 1967 Superman's comics, and people like just flock to that person? 
from my days as a former reporter, Lou Ferrigno is still going to like every single one of those. And he's got a pretty good line willing to pay 20 bucks for an autograph. <laughs> At least 20 bucks. I'm sure it's double At now. At least 20 bucks. Like, it's probably a lot more than that for some of them. Like, no joke. Uh, that that was it, man. Uh, let's see. Let's see what people wanted. To, uh, it- Did you actually do it or are you making it up right now? What? exactly did i actually do what did you actually put out a poll yeah i did yep oh okay i'm going right now i'm going right now to it on i, on I apologize i apologize but because you know it's uh because i'm not prepared i didn't have it pulled right up uh immediately um but here we go so uh let's see the options this week um let me uh the new super mario brothers movie doing good things that did not win uh, uh, either, by the way. Uh, electric toothbrushes, for whatever reason. Uh, a new study came out basically saying that electric toothbrushes are 18 times more uh, likely and better for your teeth than the original brushing. You know, just standard brushing without an electric toothbrush. I was a person that resisted the electric toothbrush for a long time. Right now, if there was a situation in my home that we had to flee the house with everything in it, with, with flee, the, if we had to flee, if we had 10 seconds to flee the house, I would grab the pictures, I would grab our saved pictures and my electric toothbrush. It'll change your life. If you've resisted the electric toothbrush, it's one of those things that you will change over the electric toothbrush and wonder, what the fuck was I doing before this? <laughs> right. <laughs> I uh I actually I, I went back to the to manual brushing to be honest. That's ridiculous. I know it's it's dumb. I get it. Um I have a reason though. I have kind of sensitive teeth. Most no, of my no, teeth no. aren't real, by the way. No, they are real, but then, well then why are they sensitive? They're sensitive because literally every tooth I've had has been worked on. I have like nub oh. I have like nubs in the back. Like I don't know why I don't have crowns, but they're like just little nubby pieces of tooth and the rattling from the that electric toothbrush just you ever been sitting in the dentist chair getting ready for that, like have a, so we'll say a cavity drilled and yep. you, you kind of get a little, you get a little sweaty, you get a little whatever. And then they start drilling and it's just me and you it just, it's just the worst feeling in the world. I fell asleep in the dentist chair while they were drilling into my teeth. Yeah. Well, that's cause you're not human. And that's cause I'm sorry. You have a low oh, IQ. That's because I'm just like, look, I'm going to zone out. Dude, that's, I've never known anyone to fall asleep during a dental procedure except for you. So congratulations. Yeah. I mean, I was, I, I don't know if I was a hundred percent asleep, but I was definitely like in a trance like state. Were you, well, wait, 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 were you under like, uh, um, uh, anesthesia or whatever gas? Well, in that, in that area, but not the rest, not overall. No, okay. that area was numb, but, okay, yeah, but- I was not under anesthesia so that doesn't but count did... you have to be not like nothing just going nobody through. could fall asleep like that nobody, nobody could fall asleep with that amount of pain no oh, god that would hurt if, so bad. if there's somebody out there that has i i don't care if you have proof or not just send us an email because i i want to know because you are you are above and that's beyond a, that's a beast uh anyway so what won this week um <laughs> it's kind of the most it's funny but it's not funny and that is the um phantasmic dragon setting on fire at Disneyland caught fire. And uh, it was quite the spectacle for folks in the park. The best uh, video that came out of it was people going over, excuse me, the, uh, the falls, like the grand, the magic Canyon falls. And as they're going down, there's just a blaze to their right side. Um, It's just, I'm not going to theme parks, man. I, you know what? I, my wife has been bothering me to go to Disney world not land world because we're closer to Florida. I have no desire to take my my young daughters to uh, to Disney. None. If there is a hell that exists, my idea of hell is Disney World in the summer. Uh, I mean, listen, and we both know you know more than I do because you were out there reporting sometimes on it. It, uh, yeah, I nope, don't. I want nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with and it. The, if that's your thing. That's your thing. But for me, oh, I don't even like to drive by them. I don't even. I, I want nothing to do with theme parks. Give me a zoo. Give me a zoo on a on a on a spring day. I'll take that a million times over uh, Disney World. That's what we could do. Top five places we have no interest in going. Disney World number one. 
Disney World would be up there for me. I'd go to Legoland, though. I could enjoy some Legoland. I could also go to one of those more theme parky theme parks or less less theme parky theme parks, like where it's just straight rides. I'm not impressed. I've never cared about like, oh, look at this great decoration leading into the ride. I just want to get on the fucking ride. How about we do that? How about we spend less money decorating the ride and more money getting me on the ride? I mean, the Midwest has the best theme park in the country, Cedar Point. Oh, I thought you were going to say Joyland, where I'm from in Wichita, which is an abandoned theme park that people used to sneak into. No. no. Have you ever seen abandoned theme parks online? It's pretty interesting. It's kind of crazy looking. I'm I'm sure Joyland it gave lots of little Nick Vinzans a lot of pleasure in while there were children. I feel like people used to sneak in there and drink. But, uh, okay, are you ready for our top five? I am. This is a tough one. It's a tough top five this week. There's a lot of ones that I think that could be up there close to the top. I think that there is a dominant number one, but Mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that could push into it. So our top five is top five space movies. It's your number five. So I'm going to ask this question right off the bat because this is going to determine where we go on this top five. Okay, okay, okay. Did you go personal preference or critically acclaimed movies as your uh, for your top five? I went with neither one of those matters. I went with the best movies. Okay, well, this how this is how I'm going to start off my list. Uh, number five, uh, I have Starship Troopers. What? That movie is like a joke movie. I didn't think that anybody actually liked that movie. I mean, the only listen I get I get on the list of top uh, space movies ever. It's not it's not even a talker, but it's not even on the top one hundred. I don't think. But I think if there was a list of a hundred space movies, it would be ninety nine. That might be the worst space movie. But for me, you know, it was what it come out ninety six, ninety seven. It's it's a cult hit. Um, it's a fun movie. I mean, it's just. I, you know, it's it's a personal uh, favorite of mine, which everyone who's listening to this that knows me is going to say, wow, of course he put that on his top five. But uh, my list it, will go up from here, I promise. Well, it can't go down. It can it definitely cannot go down. That's a good, that's, I mean, it's it's not a good movie. But um, listen, Neil Patrick Harris is in it, so get off my back about it. I don't think that Neil Patrick Harris really, like, that's not... That's not the Trump card that he once was. Like, okay. <laughs> That's one of those actors like, well, he's in it. Yeah. And? Yeah. So what's your point? Casper Van Dien, let's go. My number five is Predator. Predator is a great, great choice. I um Yeah, I don't I don't have him on I don't have it on the list, but it that's a great uh that's a great movie. I think that you can make an argument that Arnold Schwarzenegger had an action run that is better than anybody else of all time maybe will smith could compete with him but schwarzenegger had terminator predator commando total recall yeah i don't i don't know in terms of action stars um i mean i i, I know we we laugh a lot about about the rock but i think the rock is up there in terms of no, action stars but, but those aren't movies that hold together they don't like they arnold don't. schwarzenegger's movies are the rock starred in like movie all right they're making this movie this year kind of movies like the rock starred in forgettable movies <laughs> arnold schwarzenegger did not star in forgettable movies all of the rocks movies are forgettable yeah uh, i mean that's tough that's tough i can't even think of the, any movies that he's been in right now I mean, I, I literally cannot think of any movies at this second that he has been in besides Fast and Furious. I mean, he's Jumanji, uh, but not like Schwarzenegger, where you can just run right, down right. the list I'm, of movies that he was in. I I, I think you're I, you might be right. Our Arnold may have been, may have had the best run as an action movie star for for legacy roles. I think you're correct. Yeah. OK. What's your number four? Man, this is so tough because I there's so many. Um I'm going to go with Alien at my number four. Okay. I've heard that's a good movie. It's too scary for me to watch. <laughs> that's that's fair. I On my honorable mention, I have Prometheus as well. I have to give that a shout out because that's also a great movie. But uh, Aliens, um, 
or Alien, rather, is my number four. Space Jam. <laughs> Space Jam's a good movie. It's fine. I don't. I didn't even have it on my list. I guess because I. I don't know why I didn't consider that a space movie, but it's it's it is a space movie. L- literally has space in it. Yeah. The title. Yeah. It's it's fine. It's uh, definitely a space uh, a movie. So. Yeah, it just has aliens in it. Okay, it's your number three. Ah, uh, man, this is gonna give me a lot of grief, but I'm gonna do it. Uh, Independence Day. Ew. I know, I know, but uh, listen, it's I have two. It is a good movie. I have two reasons. I don't know if it's a good movie. I don't. It's probably a shit movie, but it's it's a cult classic, and everyone, whether you want to admit it or not, has seen it. And if you say you haven't, I don't believe you. Yeah, but they did they remake it once or twice? How many sequels did it have? I don't, I don't even I I honestly have no idea. There's only one Independence Day to me. Right. Like even if they made another one, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Man, my, my number 3, I have a hard time because I've got 3 movies that I would all kind of the same. No, I take that back. I'm going to make my number three a tie between Guardians of the Galaxy and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Both of those kind of like funny, action-oriented space movies. So uh, so Guardians is all my honorable mention. I don't have uh, um, Hitchhiker's Guide. Guardians easily could have been my number five, but I went with the personal choice. But... Uh... Yeah, Galaxy, I don't know, or Hitch- Hitchhiker's Guide, not 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 so sure of, but uh, Guardians is a great choice, great choice. Oh, okay, so number two. Uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey, which, you know, it's still considered possibly one of the greatest cinematic mo- uh, moments of all time. You have to have it on your top five of space anything. I don't even have it on my honorable mention. Jesus Christ. That's one of those movies that I feel like people talk about it like they like it. Like, oh, I've seen that. I'm sophisticated. I get it. I'm sophisticated. But I don't think people actually like that movie. Like, I watched it. It was like, okay. Where's some explosions, man? <laughs> I mean, Hell 9000 is, is amazing. You never expect that until, what, half halfway three quarters through the movie when it just goes into i'm gonna break everything in this you know i'm gonna break this whole entire world and it happens is that what happened oh maybe i never watched the whole movie well you should it's it's definitely worth it didn't somebody get ejected into space (laughs) is that gravity i think now you're confusing it with gravity maybe i'm confusing it with gravity (laughs) uh was that your number two that was yeah my number two i thought long and hard about making it number one I would have made it number one if not for one other movie that is in this particular franchise. But my number two is Spaceballs. <laughs> That's fair. I uh, I have Spaceballs on, on my honorable mention. So our number one is unanimous, right? Yeah. Wally. What's your number one? You don't like Wally? You can't walk away to Wally. Now, if I would have said Men in Black, I would be okay with you walking away. But Wally is a pretty good movie. And I would have liked to put it on its list. But I don't think that Wally has the cultural resonance that's needed to make the top five. What's your number one? So, it's the same as mine. So you not putting this as number one makes me wonder. I mean, this is a space movie, but I think you're going to be critical of it. But my, Wally? What, my what number one okay, is Star go. Wars. Yeah, it has to be Star Wars. Yeah. But I would make an argument that if not for Empire Strikes Back, I would have put Spaceballs at number one. You didn't even have Star Wars on the list, I don't think. I have Star Wars as my number one. Oh, you do have Star Oh, you were messing with me uh, with Wally. I literally Welcome walked sh- away. Like, I, I, I just left. Walk, welcome to the show. I just walked. Well, like, thanks for participating. It's our 200 and almost 50th episode. I was like, this fucking guy doesn't Sarcasm. Not, is your sarcasm detector not detecting sarcasm? No, because you you were, you were just looked at me with that look like, yeah, I did that. Yeah, fine. Star Wars is fine. Okay. All right. I'm calm down now. Go into your, you know, go, go into your spiel about it, please. 
It has to be Star Wars, I think. But it's Star Wars as a franchise, the only movies that I would say are great Star Wars movies, not entertaining, not interesting to Star Wars fans, but our great Star Wars movies are the original, The Empire Strikes Back, Revenge of the Sith is a good movie. That's got a lot of stuff going on. And other people seem to have liked Rogue One, but I was like, okay, it's all right. Yeah, I, I'd agree with your list. I mean, any anything from the, what, the 8, 9, 10 and all that, I, I don't really, I mean, they're good movies, but no. they're not. They're not the even the first three or what or whatever four five six I guess if you want to be technical yeah um yeah I mean the, the first three are are, are kind of garbage one and two um but Samuel L Jackson has a pretty prominent part in part two so that's fine uh, Revenge of the Sith is what it is four five six are good seven eight like I'm not even sure I can name you the titles uh, of like seven eight nine ten eleven eighty seven I'm not sure. The only thing about Seven, which I think is like The Force Awakens, is that was the first time that I went to a movie theater and was like, oh, I'm excited to see this movie. People were excited to see that. And then they realized halfway through it that, oh, wait, this is just the first movie updated. This is like a remake. It's not <laughs> even a new movie. Anyway, we can go off on the Star Wars stuff. But I do think Star Wars is number one. And it's not even close. Not, I mean... Which is funny because I debated. I'm I've never been a Trekkie, but I debated like just putting Star Trek on the list somewhere because I feel like Star Trek, though not not obviously as critically acclaimed as Star Wars, but still everybody knows what Star Trek is. Yeah, but I think the only Star Trek movie that's big is Wrath of Khan, which is the second one I think. I'm sorry, what Star did you Trek call me? Two, Wrath of Khan. Uh, let's see. I have a lot on my honorable mention. I don't know how long yours is. Uh, it's probably about the same as yours. Let's go. Let's hear it. Uh, let's see. So I, I do have Wally. I have The Martian, The Right Stuff, uh, 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 First Man, Event Horizon, which is I think a very underrated, like dark horror movie, but it's it's really good with Sam Neill and Lawrence Fishburne. Um, yeah, that seen parts of that yeah, like that looks like oh that's too scary for me yeah. but i think that that movie picked up like a cult status yeah it would be too scary underrated movie um apollo 11 another horror movie apollo 13 the tom hanks movie galaxy quest wait apollo 11 is a horror movie it is yeah yep uh really there wasn't an, four or five years ago i think there wasn't an apollo wasn't there a real apollo 11 there, i believe there was but this is like the alternative take as to if you know things went you know to the wayside um okay outland okay. starring sean connery uh and gravity which it's kind of a mixed like there, there are no there's nobody in the middle on gravity either you loved it or you hated it and um i thought clooney and sandra bullock did a good job in that movie the only other movies that I have on my list that you didn't have, which I thought about putting this in the top five, was Dune. The new Dune is very good. I haven't and seen I could, it, but I know nothing of the universe either to really comment on it. How many times have you burped in the last minute? <laughs> I mean, that's what happens when you're gassy, I guess. Are you drinking? Are you drinking a beer? Uh, actually, actually, I've had two ciders. Uh, while talking to you, so a cider a beer? It's an alcoholic beverage. It's not a beer, but it's you know it's it's still an alcoholic beverage. We're recording this at nine a.m. on a Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs>